Alas, our colleague Jennifer Tonkovich has taken ill, and she is not going to be able to present her paper today in person. I think almost everyone in this room knows her. She's the Eugene and Claire Thaw Curator in the Department of Drawings uh, and Prints at the Morgan Library, and she's been there for many, many years, uh, collaborating on numerous exhibitions, also collaborating with Christoph Vogtherr on an exhibition at the Wallace Collection that was devoted to the 18th century French collector Jean de Julien, which is the subject of her her paper. Uh, her paper is titled, I Still Spent Much More Than I Had Planned, Buying Drawings at the Julienne uh, 1767 Sale. And happily, Jennifer Wright, the head of the Department of Drawings at Christie's, has agreed to read Jennifer Tonkovich's paper this afternoon. So please welcome Jennifer and with a thank you for stepping in the breach. <laughs> Thank you. I know I'm not the Jennifer you were expecting to see here today, but um, we'll get through this together. And I think um, you will find after you hear Jennifer's superb paper that actually getting someone who works at an auction house selling drawings isn't a, a bad substitute for the actual author here today. Let's see. OK. The title of this talk is taken from Mariette's Lament after Jean de Julien's 1767 sale. In a letter to his fellow collector, Paolo Maria Pachaudi, Mariette grouses, today, everywhere is full of well-informed people. One cannot hope for the unexpected discoveries any longer. At least one could not make them at the Julien sale, which took place a short while ago. Paintings, drawings, prints, sculptures, porcelain, everything fetched excessive prices. I had to follow the torrent, and although I do not at all regret the money I spent, I still spent more than I had planned, and more than I would have spent some years ago. But apart from that, I obtained good things, and good things are never too expensive. Well, I still hear that a lot today, so. <laughs> but back to Jennifer Tonkovich. Mariette's profligacy indicates the success of the sale, where an informative catalog made it possible for wide participation by knowledgeable buyers, and the resulting competition drove up prices. In fact, Julienne's sale marks a key moment in the expansion of the market for drawings and the increased collecting of drawings as a social and intellectual pursuit. It marks the beginning of a trend that would culminate in the great sales of the following decade, including Mariette's own, in which a portrait drawing by Van Dyck would sell for three times the price of the highest selling Van Dyck drawing in Julienne's sale. Today, we will look more closely at how Julienne's sale reflected the demand for drawings in the critical decade of the 1760s. Jean de Julien is a significant but often overlooked figure in the world of drawings collectors. He was born in 1686 and died at the age of 80 in 1766. He came to maturity in the late years of the increasingly pious Louis XIV and lived under the regency and long reign of Louis XV. Louis Clementerie, in his 1877 study of 18th century art lovers, commented on collectors who were wealthy bankers, aristocrats, and connoisseurs before turning to Julienne and remarking, here is a new nuance, the industrial and merchant amateur wanting, to work, wanting works of art to distract him from the concerns of his trade. Julienne was the head of a prosperous family business that specialized in dyeing woolen fabrics a rich scarlet at a time when the textile trade was thriving, part of a robust economy for luxury goods. Julien is perhaps best remembered as the patron behind the Recoil Julien, a compendium of prints after paintings and drawings by Antoine Watteau, produced by various engravers in the 1720s. Julien likely started collecting while a young adult in his 20s, in the 1710s. By the time of his death in 1766, Julien's drawings cabinet was less than a third of the size of Mariette's, and by most counts, around 2,300 drawings. The figure increases if one counts by the 1764 inventory of possessions in Julien's testament, which counted drawings such as the 558 sheets by Stefano della Bella individually, rather than as one lot as they appear in the Julien sale. 
The number of actual drawings may have been more than 4,000. Still, that is less than half the size of Marriott's holdings. Several factors explain the differences in scale. Julian did not have the massive wealth of bankers such as Yabak or Crozaw, nor did he inherit a collection as Marriott had. But his more modestly scaled collection was a repository for many great drawings. Naturally, his collection, measured by the contents of his sale, was almost exclusively made up of works from Les Trois Bonnes Écoles, that is, Italian Old Masters, 163 lots, Golden Age Dutch and Flemish works, 240 lots, and French artists, 327 lots. In contrast, other schools are hardly represented. Of the 327 French school lots, 248 were by 18th century artists. Thus, over one third of the drawings lots in Julien's sale were by artists active during his lifetime. Any auction is impacted by the prevailing social and economic conditions, and Julien's was no different. By the 1760s, competition for luxury goods at auction in Paris certainly had increased. Christophe Pomian tabulated a rise in the number of collectors in Paris from 150 between 1700 and 1720 to 500 between 1750 and 1790. Although this estimate is not particular to drawings collectors, certainly the buying and selling of drawings saw a dramatic increase during the decades around mid-century. As Hans von Migrote noted, there were 140 sales documented in Paris between 1700 and 1750, while between 1750 and 1815, there are 1,664. That is, from an average of about three sales a year to roughly 25. The dynamics of the sale and the degree to which it was an international event were, in part, guided by politics. Great Britain and France had been in long-standing conflict. The Seven Years' War was resolved in 1763, with Great Britain emerging as the more powerful state. The conclusion of the war also saw King Frederick of Prussia, who had allied with Great Britain, emerge as a major world power. 1763 was also the year that in Russia, the Prussian-born Catherine seized power when her husband, Peter II, was killed in a coup. Once the Treaty of Paris had created a general peace throughout Europe, nearly every nation began establishing a national museum, which, uh, which ushered in the rise of public cabinets. Perhaps the most famous sale of drawings before Julien's and the one at which many collectors, including Mariette and Julien, significantly augmented their collections was the 1742 sale of Pierre Crozat. As we now know, thanks to the work of Magnus Olesen, there were only 14 buyers at Crozat's legendary sale, and all of them were friends of Mariette's. Carl Gustav Tessin recounted the spirit of gentlemanly agreement among the buyers, which resulted in the many, which resulted in many of those present acquiring works at far below their value. Since the proceeds were destined for charity, Crozat had wanted the sale to benefit the poor of Paris. There was no individual to ensure profit was maximized. Tessin's account also shows that Mariette had such, such success because the other buyers voluntarily let him have many items for no more than the reserve price. <laughs> Although we know from his later notes in Julien's sale catalog that he did not get every lot he desired. But nonetheless, the prices at the sale are a poor indicator of the market. It was these low prices, in fact, which led Marriott to exclaim repeatedly at the high prices fetched by Crozat drawings in Julien's sale, since he recalled their original and artificially low price. In the 25 years between the Crozat and Julien sales, were there comparable opportunities for acquiring drawings at auction? not in terms of sheer numbers of drawings sold and not necessarily in terms of quality. In fact, in the decade between the Duc de Taillard sale in March 1756, when his collection of more than 500 drawings was sold, and Julien's own sale in the spring of 1767 with more than 2,300 drawings, many with venerated provenance and a reputation for quality, no other sale in Paris contained even half as many drawings. 
The next highest number of drawings in a single auction is found in the 1758 sale of the collection of Joseph Le Lorrain, Catherine the Great's court painter, which contained one lot with 800 drawings by different masters. Julienne's sale represented an opportunity the likes of which hadn't been seen for 25 years. For Julienne's sale, the expert Pierre Remy prepared a catalog of the paintings, drawings, and prints in Julienne's collection. The most important and innovative aspect of the drawings lots is that unlike in the Crozat sale, and even more so than in the Taillard sale, most of the top drawing lots were sold individually, or at most two or three drawings per lot, although there are larger group lots within the sale. The most revelatory source concerning sale room activity we have is Marriott's own copy of the catalog in the National Art Library, London, in which he annotated virtually every drawing lot in the margins, noting the day sold, price, sometimes the buyer, and his commentary, which offers everything from observations on quality, condition, and Julienne's sources, and frequently corrects Remy's descriptions and attributions, as well as providing a more accurate account of the buyers. Remy's catalog certainly provided accessibility and information to potential buyers, as did the setup of the sale. This is the transparency that helped the market flourish and so enervated Marriott. The sale was organized over a span of 54 days, on 36 of which artwork was sold, from the 30th of March to the 22nd of May. Viewing began about two weeks before the sale in Julien's Hotel Particulier on the Rue des Gobelins, which was opened from 9 to 12, except on Sundays and holidays, allowing plenty of time for collectors to consider their bids. A schedule of the lots to be sold each day was distributed eight days before the start of the sale. Works were brought to the Salon Carré of the Louvre, where they were sold in daily sessions with a mixture of paintings, drawings, prints, art objects, and furniture. As with any major auction, the first question is, what were the stars of the sale? For a single drawing, Greuze's The Village Wedding, which went for 422 livres, caused M Mariette to remark that it will be without a doubt the most expensive drawing in the sale but also he is the man in fashion. This is the sheet that was recently acquired by the Met and which Perrin Stein conclusively demonstrated was the one from Julienne's sale. A great framed parasol battle scene that hung among Julienne's paintings commanded 620 livres from the Chevalier de Ravan, who bought 23 lots at the sale. These high-value lots are in keeping with the trend toward genre scenes and away from historical subjects, a phenomenon often attributed to all of the new money entering the market. Among the French school, contemporary art won the day. Among the northern schools, the highest price lot was a sheet by Anthony Van Dyke, a study for the painting Now in the Met. The drawing, done in black chalk and brown ink, formerly in the Hermitage, is now lost. It was sold to Prince Dmitry Galitsyn, the Russian diplomat buying for Catherine the Great, for 397 livres. Among the Italian drawings, unsurprisingly, a highly finished drawing by Barocci escalated to 600 livres, also for the Tsarina. Mariette considered it not at all well preserved as a Barocci in his collection and thought the price absurd. Naturally, artists who were a la mode were a cause of consternation to Mariette, who remarked that Remy was paying high prices for fashionable artists, such as two lots by Lucas Van Uden, untraced, but here's an example of the type, the first of which went for 160 leaves, an exorbitant price, and the second for 72, which Mariette bemoans, it is because these drawings are demode, but in truth they are without intelligence and in any other circumstance we wouldn't look at them. <laughs> Artists such as Van Uden may have enjoyed success, as, Patri as Patrick Michel has suggested is true of paintings, because new collectors, as opposed to connoisseurs, were paying for visible labor, hence highly finished works fared better. The performance of works by 18th century artists is particularly interesting. A Bouchardon lot of five drawings commanded a higher price than even the Barocci. The prices obtained by such works astonished Mariette, although the phenomenon would grow in the following years. 
Mariette expressed amazement at a sheet by Giovanni Paolo Panini that sold for 490 livres and was acquired for Randon de Brosset, who he felt paid six times its value. As it turns out, that same sheet would sell for more than twice that a decade later in Randon de Brosset's 1777 sale, where it fetched 1,114 livres. As with the Panini, Mariette also expressed shock at the prices achieved by the views of Jean Chauffourier, his former teacher. This one is from the collection, remarking, I never would have imagined that drawings of this type could ever rise to such high prices. It is amusing to note that issues of attribution plagued contemporary art, since one aspect of their greater appeal is, in theory, that they are free of the uncertainty of attribution that plagues the old masters. A lot given by Remy to Jean-Baptiste Marie Pierre of a framed landscape drawing sold for 36 livres. Mariette, in his initial note on the lot, observed, it is an exact copy, lightly colored, of a drawing in black chalk that appears to be from Bologna and that I think has never been seen by Monsieur Pierre. I must discuss this with him. He returned later to add, I have done this, and he told me that he had never seen this drawing. A similar problem characterizes the drawing sold by Bouchardon, one of the collector's favorite artists who died in 1762. Among the 43 lots with drawings by Bouchardon, in fact, Mariette discovered numerous problems of attribution, identifying at least 10 lots containing 16 drawings as the works of either Pierre Charles Tremolier or Francois or Carl Venlo. One way into understanding the very particular dynamics of this sale is to look at who was buying. Such a view also gives us a portrait of the sale as a social event. The total number of buyers in the drawings portion of the sale is roughly between 89 and 95, given that several dealers were bidding on behalf of others who are sometimes identifiable and sometimes not. We've been able to identify most of them and it is a fascinating portrait of the drawings world in Paris in 1767. At the sale, 53 buyers, more than half, bought three lots or less. 19 buyers bought 10 lots or more. There was a large group of active participants engaging at a, engaging at a range of levels. Every category of buyer was represented. Dealers, amateurs, financiers, artists, foreign heads of state, friends of the collector, government officials. We'll discuss a few of those today. Somewhat surprisingly, given the dynamics of the painting portion of the sale, the largest buyer of drawings in terms of number of lots purchased was not some foreign leader or financier, but Marie-Anne Catherine Bijot de Grafferon, la Présidente de Bondeville. She was not just the main buyer among the wealthy amateurs, taking home 67 lots. She acquired more than even the most acquisitive dealers except Francois Jolain, father and son together. Widowed in 1761, La Présidente Bandeville was part of the intimate circle surrounding Jean-Jacques Rousseau, Julienne, and Boucher. She was famed for her cabinet of natural history material, especially shells, and collected drawings and paintings of all three schools. She was an intimate of Madame de Montoy, the wife of Julienne's beloved nephew, John Baptiste de Montoy. Most of the lots she, were, she acquired were in the middle range, all but five were under 100 leave. Among the five highest priced lots she acquired was this color drawing by Jordans for 200 leave. And on the lower end, this Rembrandt study for a portrait she picked up for nine leave. Among the dealers, Francois Julien and his son were the most active, snapping up 71 lots. They bought nearly equally among Italian, Northern, and French schools with a wide range in price from nine to 360 leave, which was paid for this Cornelis Vischer now in the British Museum. In contrast, Remy, the expert for the sale, secured at least 60 lots with 25 Northern and 37 French. It seems that he did not acquire any Italian drawings for himself, though according to Mariette's notes, he may have bought this Barocci study for the deposition given to the Uffizi in 1866, for a curio named Fonteray from Marseille. He also took bids from Catherine the Great and other distinguished collectors, so it was not just buying for stock. P. 
Pierre-Francois Bassin, the expert and print, pu print publisher who eventually would organize Mariette's own sale, bought 57 lots, including 25 Italian drawing lots, 17 French, and 14 Northern, ranging from six to 182 livres, including this Van Dyke drawing in the Louvre, which cost him 103 livres. Although at first glance it seems the buyers were almost exclusively French, we know from Mariette's notes that French dealers and agents took bids from foreign contacts. During the Seven Years' War, English buyers are hard to find in records of French auctions, although the unregulated auction houses in England were a hive of activity. Unfortunately, some English bidders, such as Horace Walpole, were ultimately unsuccessful in their attempt, and so their presence is nearly undocumented. We wouldn't know about Walpole's bids if he hadn't complained to the American diplomat Horace Mann. I heard from Paris that I had no success at the sale of Monsieur Julien's cabinet, where everything sold as extravagantly as if the auction had been here. Perhaps the biggest mystery is an agent known as Dumasso, with several variant spellings, who Mariette notes is buying for England. Who is this buyer who acquired 15 lots, including Barocci's holy family with the infant St. John for 78 leave, that had sold for 20 leave at Crozat's sale? A framed Parmigianino study for the Staccata for 180 leave. This is a drawing that Mariette notes he could have bought at the, at the 1757 Poitiers sale, but didn't because he was convinced it was a copy. It's later found in English collections and is probably the one now in the Louvre, which is indeed considered a copy. An Ostada Jean Racine of a milk seller, now in the Fondation Custodia, bought for a respectable 121 leave and a callow of a fare for a robust 160, which is now in the Met. Who exactly were his clients in England? Another mystery is for whom Bassan was bidding on a Guercino lot with two drawings that sold for 182 leave. Mariette notes, an Englishman had commissioned him and he made a foolish purchase. The Englishman is in default and has left him with the drawings. We have no way of knowing who this English bidder is, but the, fair, the perils of foreign bidders emerge through such instances. The description and dimensions suggest that one of these sheets could be this Guercino at the National Gallery. While no overtly Dutch names seemed to be recorded among the buyers, Mariette occasionally noted when works were purchased for Holland. As he notes of two sheets by Cornelis Dussart sold at 160, they were bought to be sent to Holland and it is well done. The principal known bidder for Holland was Pierre Fouquet, the Amsterdam-based dealer who bought about 20 lots. Unsurprisingly, there were northern landscape drawings. Brill, Van Uden, Svanvelt, that achieved high prices, although the generality of their lot descriptions makes these works difficult to identify. More reasonable purchases included sheets by Rembrandt, 36 leave, perhaps even this depiction of the presentation now in the Louvre. But there were also major purchases of French landscapes by Claude and Israel Sylvestre view of Florence and Rome. And some more modest sheets, such as batched, a batch of works by Watteau, including, oops, sorry, including this mount uh, with two animal studies. The consistent focus of his purchases on landscape and animal studies makes sense given the market for such subjects in Holland. Meanwhile, in Russia, the demand for drawings was growing and Paris was a key place for buying en masse. With the 1764 founding of the Hermitage, Hermitage Picture Gallery, Catherine the Great was embarking on a major collecting endeavor. Among the star lots was the great Barocci, as well as standouts by Jordans and Van Dyck. Catherine obtained two sheets, including this study for the Descent of the Holy Spirit for 48 leaves. It was among 24 works that sold for 15 leaves at Crozat's sale. Drawings by Poussin, such as the Crossing of the Red Sea, were among the French, with the largest single purchase being an album of 926 drawings by Callot, which was purchased for 451 leaves. In all, Catherine acquired a total of 23 drawings plus the Callot album. 
This small batch gets swallowed up once her core collection, purchase of the Cobenzel sale collection of 4,000 sheets, was made the following year. But she and her agents made a start at the Julianne sale. To return to France, it is Mariette's activity at the sale that can provide an insider's view of how a non-speculative collector was buying. Marriott's activities at the sale, in particular, er, is particularly revealing since he knew the market so well. He closely followed prices for decades and had a keen eye for quality and, as a dealer, money well spent. From his comments, we have a good sense of how he regarded the market and also what his personal parameters were for collecting. Most of the works he bought were in the 20 to 40 leave range, and the times that he went as high as 80 and once to 100, he noted that it was a stretch for him and one he undertook only when the quality warranted. Marriott's principal strategy was to buy undervalued works, many masquerading under erroneous attributions, which rendered them affordable. He's elated when buying a drawing for 18 leave that Remy gives to one of the Gimignani, but that Marriott thinks is by Baciccio or Giovanni Maria Morandi. The sheet is now in the Louvre as Morandi. Similarly, he picked up a drawing given to a disciple of Lanfranco for 40 leave, convinced that it was incontestably the work of Hans Rottenhammer, whose name it is under today. Funnily, the sheet sold at the Crozat sale, along with five others in, the, in a lot attributed to Tintoretto that went for 30. Of two landscapes sold under Van Romain, which Marriott got for 24 leave, he remarked, here I am taking a big risk that one of these two drawings will turn out to be by Johann Heinrich de Roos, and one of the most beautiful of them. He also bought a sheet for 21 leave given to David Binkboons, but which he confessed, it isn't difficult to see that this beautiful drawing is by Anibale Karachi. Why then is it placed among the Flemish drawings? This gave me a surprising advantage to see here at this price. That which we sold in the Crozat sale was a copy so perfect we should not be ashamed of the mistake. He's referring to a copy by Grimaldi that sold at Christie's in 1994. While these prices are comparable to the lots he purchased at Crozat, here he was getting one or two drawings most often and not lots of 10 or more sheets. Same price, fewer drawings. He also worked closely with dealers, especially Bassan, who often bid for him, and shared in lots of multiple drawings, a practice which was common. Marriott notes that Julian let him have a drawing by Alessandro Algardi, which he believed to be by Raffaellino da Reggio, and snapped up for 15 leave. Of a lot by Leonard Bramer, purchased by Bassan for 13 leave, Marriott related, I chose two of them, which was sufficient for me to learn the draftsmanship of this master. His costliest purchase at the sale was a sheet attributed to Domenico Maria Canuti that he bought for a steep 100 leave. I regretted having missed this beautiful drawing at the Crozat sale, and it makes me happy to have rediscovered it. Lodovico Caracci, who this is by, never made a more beautiful one. It is a capital piece for the painting he executed in the church of San Martino in Bologna. At the Crozat sale, the drawing must have been included in one of the lots with works by Canuti. The first contained 18 sheets that sold for 72 leaves, and the second with 17 that sold for 38. So that's how Marriott spent more than he had planned at a sale of a collector who himself was an amateur draftsman and championed making prints after drawings. The reason Marriott hemorrhaged fun funds includes the thoroughly cataloged works and the long viewing, both of which create a high degree of transparency and allow for potential buyers to be well informed before the sale. The large number of drawings, over 2,300, allowed for participation at all levels by an expanded group of collectors active in the 1760s, numbering more than 90 individuals. Unlike the gentleman's agreement that prevailed at Crozat sale, unfettered competition drove the prices of fashionable work sky high, drawings that last achieved a fair market value, but undervalued works were still to be found by the connoisseur. Much that was sold represented a new high price for a drawing by the artist, although the prices would soon increase, and in some cases double, when the same works appeared at auction in the 1770s. 
The quality of drawings in Julien's sale and the renown of his collection motivated buyers at the high end, such as Catherine the Great, and also encouraged the more than 53 buyers, many financiers and nobility, who nabbed three lots or less. The fanfare around the sale, at a time of stability and peace, helped extend the opportunities to bidders from the Low Country, England, and beyond. And the robust market in Paris ensured that nearly every French collector with the means made an appearance in the sale room. The demand for drawings had now become widespread and international, a development that would reach its zenith in Paris during the 1770s, before the revolution shifted the center of the auction world to London. Seeing Julien sale at a critical moment in the history of collecting of drawings, both old masters and contemporary, and ensuring his ownership of sheets is more fully documented, enriches our understanding of the expansion of collecting of drawings as a social and intellectual pursuit. Marriott's lament of having still spent more than he had planned when drawings of superb quality and excellent provenance came up for sale is one that rings true nearly 250 years later. Thank you.